Good to be back. Man, tell you what, good to see the owls up there too, I tell you what. Um, man, it's great to be together. It's great to worship together. I know it's been a crazy time, but uh, what a joy to be in the house of God together. You know what I've noticed? I've noticed that when I call somebody who's under the age of 35 and I get their voicemail, I noticed that I don't hear these words. Please leave your name and number after the beep. You notice that? If you call somebody who's over the age of 35, they almost can't help not say that. And here's why. Because those of us that are older than 35, we were raised through the era of changing communication practices. There wasn't a, a thing called caller ID back then. In fact, it was 1971, the very first TAD, telephone answering device, was created by Casio. The thing weighed 10 pounds. It was like a huge brick. You could store only 20 messages on there, and it was a little reel-to-reel -reel tape player. But in 1983, a doctor by the name of uh, Kasuro Hashimoto from Japan, he created the first digital telephone answering device. And this thing was revolutionary because you could actually be listening to the person leaving a voicemail at the very same time as they're leaving it. So, maybe the phone would ring, and you didn't know if this was somebody important. You didn't know if you needed to answer that, like it was your spouse or your boss. Maybe it was a telemarketer, and you, you didn't want to get caught up in that phone conversation. So you could just let it go to the answering machine. And as the answering machine would beep, Hey, Sterling, uh, hey, this is uh, Pastor Brent, so just giving you a shout. I'm here at the beach. I wanted to talk to you about maybe coming to our church to speak. And if I heard that, I could leap up off the couch and pick up the phone while he was leaving a message and, you know, give him some excuse. Like, oh, sorry, uh, I had a thing. There was something going on, but I got your call, right? And you could, you could jump in and actually get that phone call when you realized it was somebody important calling you. Now... I mean, it's like second nature. You don't, even, you don't even look. I know a lot of people call me, and I just let it go straight to the voicemail. I look, I, do I need to answer that or not? Like, it's just second nature to us. But back in those days, we had to actually leave a message. And we had to, we had to remind people to leave their name and number because you didn't know who it was that was calling you. And I say all that to say, today I want to talk to you about answering the call. What do you do when you get a phone call from someone who's important? Well, you jump up now and you answer that call. If my boss calls me, listen, I'm getting that thing. If my spouse calls me, I'm getting that thing. But, I mean, nowadays, technology is so advanced. My phone literally tells me, I just noticed this. I, I don't know why it started doing this, but I started getting uh, alerts on my phone, and it says literally, spam alert. Anybody seen that? Another one came this, this past week. It said, telemarketer. I was like, oh, thank you, Apple. You are just helping me right now. But when you get somebody that's important calling you, you respond to that thing right away, right? Well, I want to look at Acts chapter 16. I want to turn our attention to the Scriptures. And I want to see the Apostle Paul and his response to uh, an important call, if you will. And in Acts chapter 16, if you have a header in your Bible, that header probably says something like this, the Macedonian call. And we want to look at Acts chapter 16. I'll start reading in verse 6. We'll end at verse 10, and let's jump in here. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Musia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Musia and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Would you pray with me as we jump into God's Word? Thank you, Lord, for this moment that we could share, and I pray that you would speak to us by your Spirit. Lord, remind us who we are in you, and open our eyes to see what you've called us to right in front of us today. May we answer the call as it comes to us by your Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. 
So if you're not familiar with the Apostle Paul, he actually didn't always go by that name. His name uh, early in life was Saul, and he was from a region called Tarsus. That's where he got the name, Saul of Tarsus. And Saul of Tarsus was a theologian. He was raised in the Jewish religion, and he thought early in the days of Christianity that it was his God-given mission in life to eradicate Christianity from the map. And he was the harshest critic. He was the biggest persecutor of the Christian faith in those early days of the church. He was literally hunting down Christians to try to throw them in prison or possibly execute them. And he had a famous encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus where he had a vision of the Lord, where he met Christ, and that was his point of conversion. And from that point forward, he became known as Paul the Apostle. And Paul the Apostle recognized that it was his now God-given mission to not be the biggest persecutor of the church, but to be the biggest promoter of the gospel. And he traveled around to try to share his story, like we sang about, and share the good news of the gospel of Jesus. And he went on an early missionary uh, trip. He went to a city called uh, Galatia in the province of Asia. And it was his first kind of stretching out into expanding the gospel beyond where it had originated in Jerusalem. Now, I say all that to say, this is actually Paul's second missionary journey. And on his second missionary journey, what he wanted to do was go back to the church that he had planted in Galatia and minister to them and encourage them. That is a great thing to do, right? They drew up this great plan, like on a whiteboard, so to speak, and said, hey, you know what? We had great favor in this town. Let's go over here. Let's encourage them, make sure they're all doing great, and then we'll go on from there. But if you noticed when we were reading there was a little bit of frustration, wasn't there? Their plans didn't quite go as they had mapped it out. And it said, we, we were kept by the Holy Spirit from going into this city. Another place, he said, the Spirit of Jesus kept us from going in this other town. Well, the Bible doesn't say how they were kept. It just says that they were kept. It says the Spirit of Jesus kept them. And maybe it was a mix of things. Maybe it was circumstances prevented them. Maybe there was stuff going on. It was the weather, and they couldn't get into this port, and they had to redirect. I don't know what it was. Maybe it was a resource challenge, and they didn't have all of the resources that they, that they thought they needed, and they fell a little bit short, and so they couldn't go all the way to where they wanted to go. I don't know how they were kept. Maybe... Maybe it was just a check in the Spirit. You know what that is, don't you? That, just that sense of, man, I wanted to go this way, but something in here is giving me different signals. I don't know why. Sometimes I can't explain it, but, but I, I just feel like this is not the way to go. I don't know specifically how they knew that this was not what God had in store for them. All I know is that Paul and his team at that time felt a little bit of a delay. And if you've ever traveled through the world's busiest airport, I'm coming to you from Atlanta, Georgia, I fly out of there a lot, and, uh, you know, sometimes you get delays. And uh, delays can be frustrating, especially if there's really bad weather going on and there's multiple airlines mul shut down, multiple gates, multiple flights, delay, delay, delay. Man, that can be very frustrating. And yet, we don't see so much of Paul's frustration. We see the optimism and the opportunity in the obstacle. You see, what Paul discovered was sometimes, sometimes God's delays are divine appointments. They said, we had a plan to go here. We wanted to go to the province of Asia. We wanted to go back to that church in Galatia and encourage them. But God said, I don't have that for you. I have something else for you. And he knew enough to say, maybe God's up to something else. Sometimes God's delays are divine appointments. I'll tell you a little bit more history. This one's more personal. I actually grew up in New Jersey. I didn't grow up in the church. I didn't know Jesus. I didn't come to faith in Christ until my sophomore year in college. As a student athlete, I was playing football at the University of Richmond, and I got saved. 
I mean, my life was radically changed. And I was so on fire for the Lord, I called my mom after I had come to Christ and said, Mom, I'm dropping out of school and I'm going into the ministry. <laughs> because that was like, well, that's what you do. Like, I love the Lord. I'm dropping everything. I said, yes, Lord, I'm going to follow you wherever and I'm going to go into ministry. Well, thankfully, she talked me off the ledge, the proverbial ledge, so to speak, and, uh, and she encouraged me to actually finish school. And, uh, and I wound up staying in school, thankfully, and uh, as my career progressed, I had a good college career playing football and uh, had a, got an agent, and we were talking to some professional teams about potentially playing professional football. And I had this growing sense that, man, God's called me to not just ministry in general, but I really felt like man, there's going to be a time that God is asking me to communicate, to speak. And I felt like I, I was going to have some type of platform. I didn't know how big or small, but I just said, man, God, you've given me something that's not just for me. I've got to share that with others. And what better way to, to have a platform than be a professional athlete and just have all kinds of people want to hear what I have to say? Well, as I came to that point in my career, I began to get that check in my spirit, that growing sense of, I don't know that this is what God has for me. And so, long story short, I wound up calling my agent, and I said, uh, hey, you're going to think I'm crazy, but uh, I'm not even going to try to play professional football. I feel like God's called me to the ministry. And he said, Sterling, you know, you're right. I do think you're crazy. <laughs> and I was like, I, I, don't, I can't explain it. He said, well, what are you going to do? And I said, I have no idea. I studied art because I wanted to play pro football. Like, I didn't really have much of a plan. And I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. So I just kind of bounced around for a bit. And you, but you know what it was for me? It was kind of a delay. I bounced around. I found myself just doing a job. And, uh, and out of nowhere, I got a phone call from one of my former teammates. And you know what he said? Much like the man from Macedonia. Can you come help us? The call was from Tallahassee, Florida. My friend had done a Bible study, uh, an outreach for some student athletes and some high profile football players, a couple guys that went on to get drafted uh, pretty high uh, from Florida State, got saved and wanted to be discipled. Then he called me and said, Hey, can you come down and help us start a church and, uh, and reach some student athletes? And I was like, Absolutely. How much you'll pay me? And he said, we can pay you $6,000 a year. And I was like, uh, wait, and then, and then what? <laughs> he was like, there's nothing else. So all that to say, I, I just knew, man, this is God. I, I, I didn't understand it. It didn't make sense on paper. But I said, hey, this is the direction I'm going to go. Not realizing that in less than two years, I would be married. I, would, I met my wife down there at Florida State when I was coaching. Had our first child down there. We started a church. A few years later, we actually moved to Atlanta to plant another church. Fast forward, I took over leading that church in 2007, and that was another delay. We took over leading it. It was a difficult transition, a lot of very stressful time. I wound up having to take three different jobs while I was pastoring a small church startup. We relocated, we relaunched, we renamed, and we started a church in a movie theater in Atlanta. And for about a year and a half, two years, it was really, it was great, but it was a lot of frustration. And at times I felt myself asking the Lord, like, did I miss it? Like, I don't really see the platform of influence and speaking. We're just struggling to try to figure out how to do church. And look, I'll be honest, in focus, it was a really, really challenging time in my life. So much so that we prayed again and felt like God said, well, why don't you just go to Kennesaw and try to start reaching out student, to student athletes and coaches at Kennesaw State. It's a Division I school. I had never even been to that school. I had never set foot on the campus. And so we, sure enough, we relocate, and it almost seemed like I was growing the church backwards. We lost a lot of people. I had to take on extra work. I thought it was stressful earlier. Man, that was a really ta challenging time. I would show up every week to church at a small gathering. We had maybe 20, 25 people, and I, and I felt like I'm failing at this. I'm not where I'm supposed to be. Something's not right. And we just began to pray. 
And I remember having times where I would pray to the Lord and said, God, I felt like you had something for me. Did I miss it? And I can so identify with the Apostle Paul here because I feel like he had a plan and I'm sure at some point he felt like, well, did I miss it? Like we had drawn it up to go this way. But what Paul discovered, it's really what I discovered, I think if we had time to share, you know, honest, heart to heart, and you could tell me a little bit of your story, you could probably tell me some of how you discovered some of this to be true. But what I discovered is that sometimes our influence is determined by our response. Our ability to respond even in challenging circumstances, even when things don't look like we drew it up. You see, I was there at that point in Kennesaw, Georgia, really struggling, feeling like a failure, and going, I just want to serve Jesus. I want to help these student athletes. I want to reach coaches. I have no idea, Lord, what you're going to do. But I prayed just like we sang. I'll follow wherever you lead. I'll go. If you open the door, I'll go. And we started just walking around the campus at Kennesaw State. And I had to share this story when I came to In Focus because there was a young lady in this church by the name of Allie Townsend. Man, she's a hero. She called me out of nowhere and said, hey, I heard you, were, you relocated to Kennesaw and you're trying to reach out to Kennesaw State. I said, yeah, Allie, that's what we're trying to do. She's like, well, you have any traction? You meet with anybody? I was like, no, I don't know anybody. She said, I got good news. There's one student athlete I know who transferred from Georgia. She's a volleyball player at Kennesaw State, and she needs, can you guess, help. She said she wants to start a Bible study. She wants to reach her teammates, but she doesn't know how. Maybe you could help her. And I was like, you know, I wish I could say I threw on my Superman cape and was like, yeah. I was really more like, I mean, yeah, I'll, I'll take anything at this point. And I called, we got together. Katie and her roommate, Grace, uh, were our first two student athletes to open the door at Kennesaw State. Well, long story short, I've been there full time now, over 10 years, uh, serving as the director of character development, where I have this unbelievable opportunity to speak to all these student athletes, to communicate with our coaches. Uh, and, and because of that work, I've been all over the country speaking to coaches that you would have heard of at universities and athletic programs that you know of and been there encouraging their student athletes in principles of character and leadership. And I've seen God do incredible things, way more than I even could have imagined when I was struggling, feeling like, man, this is a delay. Have I missed it? Sometimes our influence is directly correlated to our ability to respond, even in challenging circumstances when it doesn't make sense and it's different than I drew it up. You see, the Apostle Paul decided, I've got to go. We've got to go to Macedonia. We've got to preach the gospel to these people. Macedonia at that time was known as the gateway to the west, this area of northern Greece. And so they set sail for another port, and they, they landed there, and they began to reach out wherever they could find a hearing and meet with people in home after home. And they planted a church in a city called Philippi. They started reaching out to some people. There was a convert there named Lydia. who was the first convert on that missionary journey right? And in that moment, he began to see God's up to something. And later, he would send a letter to the church that he planted in Philippi uh, that's in your Bible now known as the epistle to the Philippians. He planted another church on that same journey in a city called Thessalonica. And in his letter to encourage, letters to encourage that church, he wrote First and Second Thessalonians. He planted another church in a city called Corinth that was very cosmopolitan. It was filled with all different kinds of people, different colors, different cultures, different languages, different religious beliefs. And in that city, he planted a church that was incredible, probably the first mega church. And he wrote letters to encourage that church, now known as First and Second Corinthians. 
You see, scholars would tell you that uh, most will argue how many letters did the Apostle Paul write, how many books of the Bible, some say 11, some say more or less. Scholars all agree that without a doubt, the Apostle Paul wrote seven at least. Out of the seven that is guaranteed that Paul wrote, five are from this exact journey. If he didn't say yes to God then, who knows where we would be as a church. His letters that have encouraged believers, billions of believers for millennia now, have been penned to encourage us, and they still encourage us today. His influence expanded probably way beyond he ever imagined. And even then, he was probably just writing a letter to his friends to say, hey, I want to encourage you. Our influence is at times directly related to our ability to respond when the call comes. Do we leap up off the couch over the coffee table and pick up the phone when we recognize God is calling me to something? Now, I would also tell you why this was so strategic and consequential is because this journey, these letters, these churches that began, actually opened up the door for what we now understand to be the diversifying of the kingdom of God. And I want to turn your attention to the book of Acts, earlier in the book of Acts, because I believe Paul, even though he came to the party late, he wasn't one of the first 12 apostles. He came several years after Jesus' death and resurrection and ascension. He had heard, and there was already stories being shared about what God did early on in the birth of the church, and he knew this story from Acts chapter 1, that Jesus, before he ascended to heaven, to his small gathering of followers, he told them this about the coming of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus said this, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and even where? To the ends of the earth. You see, this missionary journey, this response to the Macedonian call, if you will, it actually it opened the door to the gospel going to all of Europe, and then from there going to Africa, and then from there going on to Asia, and eventually making its way to South America, North America, right, because of the work of this particular journey. But what Jesus told his first followers is this. The gospel, when it comes, it's going to, by its very nature, it's going to call us to move beyond our comfort. He said the Holy Spirit will come upon you. He will empower you. Not so you can just have animated meetings and dynamic worship and celebrate the gifts that God gives you. His power will come upon you so that you can be a witness to what you've seen and heard. That you could testify and share your story of what you have seen and heard in your relationship with Jesus. You can't do it in your own strength. We need something beyond ourselves. And not only do we get power, but he said, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem. You see, the gospel was first birthed, the, the kingdom of God was born, if you will, in Jerusalem. The first church was started in Jerusalem. They had gathered together in the book of Acts at the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem. And from that point for several decades, listen, the church was very comfortable staying in Jerusalem. You see, in Jerusalem, there was a lot of people that looked the same. They spoke the same language. They wore the same clothes. They had the same values, customs, and priorities. You knew what to expect. Is this a, like a shoes-off household? Like, I don't know. When you go to somebody's house, you don't really know how they do things. Well, they didn't have that problem in Jerusalem because everyone was kind of the same. And the church was very comfortable. But listen, Jesus said, you won't just be my witnesses in Jerusalem he said, it's going to go out. 
And there was different ways that it went out. Surely there was visionary missional activity like the Apostle Paul. There was also ways that, that the kingdom was kind of pressed out. It's like if you had a ball and you squeezed it down this way, it's only going to go one direction. Right? It's going to go out. Well, it's going to go in all directions, but it's going to go out, right? And so he allowed pressure, external pressure, persecution, famine, hostility, uh, the government oppression, all these different circumstances to try to help his believers move out from where it was comfortable. And what Jesus was describing when he said Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria is this ever-expanding sphere of influence where you got farther and farther away from the group of people that you were comfortable with to farther parts of the neighborhood, if you will, or parts of the region that you know, people started to look a little bit different, and they started to talk a little bit different. People didn't dress the same. What Jesus was describing was a, a people who, under the, the leadership of the Holy Spirit, empowered by Him with a heart full of love that were willing to go out beyond where it was just comfortable, where they began to interact with people that were different than them. And it was this actual journey that helped the church move from homogeny, which is where we all look alike, sound alike, to multiculturalism. Now I think uh, Dr. King was right when he said Sunday morning at 10 a.m. is the most segregated hour in America. Sadly and tragically, it shouldn't be that way. Can we as the church respond to the Holy Spirit's leading? Even when our plans maybe get delayed, when the things we drew up get interrupted, are we willing to listen to the voice of the Spirit to say, hey, I've got something else for you? And certainly in times like we live in, maybe your delay is vocational. Maybe your delay was, man, we, we had to go on furlough or we got let go or my company closed down. I don't know what your delays are, but I'd be willing to bet you've experienced some. And in the moment that we currently live in, can we allow God's delay to be a divine appointment and allow his spirit to move us out from our comfort to engage those who maybe are a little bit different than us? How can we do that? I want to give you a few simple ideas. Number one, these aren't bullets. This, this isn't going up there. I just, as I was praying, I just jotted some thoughts down. But it's got to start with prayer. If we're willing to pray and ask God for opportunities, we've got to start there. I told you that story about Kennesaw State before I, uh, Allie even called me, before I met those volleyball players. You know what I was doing? I was walking around the campus praying. Praying, going, God, I have no idea how this could even happen. You've got to open some doors. God, would you open doors? Would you give us favor with athletic directors? Would you give us favor with coaches? Pray for opportunities in your life. And as you pray, the second thing is this. You have to be willing to be sensitive to the leading of the Spirit. God may drop something in your heart. He may bring someone across your path. If you pray for a divine appointment and then you leave from here and you go to lunch or whatever it is you do and you run into somebody, maybe it's an old uh, friend or a contact, somebody calls you out of nowhere, right? And you just go, huh, that was weird. You missed it. But if you walk out of here and you run into somebody and you start talking, you ask them a question, how have you been doing? And the door of their heart begins to open, they start to share a little bit about your life. Well, don't just be like, well, I got a thing, I gotta go. Maybe that's, maybe that's God answering your prayer. Paul knew enough to recognize that maybe we're the answer to these people's prayers. And we gotta go. Be sensitive to the leading of the Spirit. The third thing is to look with eyes of compassion. You see, if we pray and ask God for opportunities and we're sensitive to the leading of the Spirit, we also have to be willing to look with eyes of compassion. You know, it was a dozen times in the Scriptures, in the Gospels, over a dozen times, it uses this phrase, Jesus moved with compassion. 
And because he was moved with compassion, he did something. Moved with compassion. It says he saw the man with a withered hand in the temple, and he told him to stretch out his paralyzed hand. Jesus, moved with compassion, heard the servant uh, uh, talking about his son who had died and was pleading with Jesus, can you help me? And moved with compassion, he raised his son to life. Moved with compassion, Jesus looked on the crowd that had been following him for days and they were hungry. And he said, somebody's got to feed them. Hey guys, have them sit down and uh, let's give them some bread and fish. When he was moved with compassion. Another place it says, moved with compassion, Jesus saw the crowd like sheep without a shepherd. And so he told them to sit down and he began to teach them. You see, if we pray we're sensitive to the leading of the Spirit, we also have to be willing to recognize that people are struggling. People are asking for help. People are asking, how can I help? We have to look with eyes of compassion. Fourthly, to go even when you're uncomfortable. Go even when you're uncomfortable. I don't want to take a lot of time, but as I said, The gospel is going to move us if we're willing to go into places, relationships, and interactions that that maybe we're not used to. And I would challenge you, church, to go even when you're uncomfortable. And if you go, you don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to have it all figured out. You don't have to be a theologian working on your doctorate like Pastor Will. You just have to be willing to share your story. You have to know. How did you come into this thing? What does it mean to be saved? By grace, through faith, through belief in Jesus, that's it. When we sing about surrender, that's how you come to know the Lord. And what has Jesus done in your life? If we share that story, that testimony and that good news can help open the door for someone else. And lastly, if we're willing to answer the call then I would just encourage you, church, to do for the few what you wish you could do for the many. You look around and you say, somebody needs to do something about this. I wish there was big answers to the big problems in the world. Well, if we're willing to do for the few, the one or two in our sphere of influence, what we wish we could do for the many, I promise you, God will use that. Mother Teresa of Calcutta, she was a woman of less than five feet tall. She spent most of her life in poverty as a nun serving lepers and orphans in Calcutta. But by the time she died, she was a woman of global influence, had won a Nobel Peace Prize, had advised presidents and world leaders. And when somebody asked her, Mother Teresa, how are you, how are you so impactful? How are you changing the world? She said, I'm not trying to change the world. I'm trying to do for the few what I wish I could do for the many. Now, if enough people do that, then you see real change happen in the world. There's a call going out, and I think the times that we live in, they're not just delays. It's not just something to be frustrated about. It's not just our plans have changed. Maybe God's doing something. And if we respond, I think we'll be amazed at what God does with our lives. Amen.